Dr. Gop, today we are going to discuss uh, smoking and alcohol and related to bariatric surgery process and pre and post surgical. So overall, um, uh, if you can kind of uh, give us the background on this issue, why this is important and what patients uh, should be expecting from us. Yeah, I want to start with alcohol this time because maybe we have started with smoking other times and we may not have devoted as much time to alcohol. So essentially, this is a very important question that comes up all the time. You know, doctor, can I have some alcohol after I've had bariatric surgery? And the uh, simple answer to that is yes, you can, but, you know, there is a big but there, right? And we have to understand all those intricacies and uh, make sure patients also understand them. So one of the things that are very, very clear is that after bariatric surgery, the effect of alcohol is a lot more significant on the body than it is before bariatric surgery, right? And that is because the changes that we make with bariatric surgery allow for things that we ingest to be absorbed much more quickly and readily after bariatric surgery. So, you know, people have actually measured how long it takes for alcohol to achieve peak levels after bariatric surgery and uh, for the gastric sleeve within nine minutes. For the gastric bypass, it could be as little as five minutes and you've got peak alcohol levels, you know. Uh, a patient, somebody who drinks a glass of wine could have, you know, uh, alcohol levels that are higher than the driving limits, you know, with just one glass of uh, alcohol after gastric bypass. So, there are drastic effects of alcohol on the body, and these are important for people to understand, right? So when they drink alcohol, the effect of alcohol will be a lot stronger and a lot quicker, but also the alcohol doesn't leave the bloodstream uh, until much later compared to a person who hasn't had bariatric surgery. So the effect is going to be there. So these are important things for people to know and understand. And then oh. there are... Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. So, and then obviously there are the other issues that have to be considered that are very much related to the issue of being a bariatric patient. You obviously want to minimize the intake of excess calories that are not going to help you to lose weight, but also they may really sabotage your attempts at losing weight by getting you more calories. So people could drink alcohol, they have to understand they are taking excess calories. Alcohol itself is something that stimulates appetite very often. And so people may be uh, tended to consume more food uh, after they drink alcohol, or people may not be as clear minded to understand and follow their attitude, you know, after they drink alcohol. So all these issues have an impact. But how about dehydration? We talk about dehydration being a major issue, right? For bariatric patients, we emphasize to them that they have to drink a lot of, uh, a lot of water and the reason we say that is their ability to catch up with thirst is limited. You know, if they are thirsty, they cannot just grab a bottle of water and then drink continuously because their stomach is so small, right? So if they drink alcohol on top of that, as we know, alcohol dehydrates people, right? So that is going to contribute significantly to it as well. So all these effects of alcohol, alcohol impacting your ability to think, alcohol being much more intoxicating, at smaller amounts and for longer period of time after bariatric person has had bariatric surgery, all these are important issues. So the um, I think uh, we really need to understand um, this is not about just. Uh, I always make this point in almost every other episode. It's not about just uh, patients who are going through the surgery, but patients who are not going through the surgery or people like us who are uh, not going to go through, hopefully, any of the process uh, because we are trying to maintain what we have by limiting alcohol uh, consumption. Uh, and that's kind of like, it's not like we are, the, the patients of bariatric surgery are being the victim because this is what we expect from everyone. So there shouldn't be any uh, relentless, just, uh, you know, uh, out of control drinking, but now knowing that your body is going to go through a big change, that's what I hear from you is, uh, like I just uh, saw that patient that you sent me uh, with the uh, BMI graph, that patient lost 120, 130 pounds. Uh, so yeah. 
when you when you lose, uh, so let's just highlight that's not a bad thing. So we want people to lose uh, that much weight, right? Yeah. But that's a that's a new person, new body, so yeah. that everything is going to be different, uh, and how our body is reacting to certain things because that happens in a very short amount of time. So it's not happening in six years; it's happening in six seven months. So therefore, uh, we are going to see. Uh, we are not going to know how we are going to react to those. And the best thing is the being uh, knowledgeable. So this is all about how we are prepping our lives, how right. we are prepping our own body. Yeah. So th these are essentially it, right? To understanding that your body is different after bariatric surgery, right? And then what alcohol does. So how, how, how should people go about it? What kind of guidance would I give them as a bariatric surgeon? One of the things I tell people, Kamal, is that if you've had bariatric surgery, avoid alcohol for at least six months. Mm -hmm. It's just keep it out, right? Don't even think about it, right? For six months, right? And then afterwards, if you were to introduce it, then there are some important rules. We talked about the fact of quantity, right? You know, mm -hmm. the amount of alcohol that could make you intoxicated before bariatric surgery now is way, way too much. Really a much smaller amount, maybe half of that, maybe a quarter of that could be intoxicating now, right? So that's important. But the other things to consider are, you know, when you are considering an alcoholic drink, of course, you want to make sure you don't consider something that, uh, you know, is carbonated. Right? So beer and things like that are out, right? Because... We, as a guideline, we tell people not to have anything carbonated, right? The next thing is, if you're going to have mixed drinks, make sure you don't get something that has too much uh, uh, calories, too much sweets in it, right? Because those by themselves are going to much increase much more the effect of the excess calorie when, you are, when you're about to drink. And then, as uh, we were mentioning earlier on, you have to be measured. It's very important because, you know, sometimes... If people get distracted and drink too much and they get intoxicated too quickly, then their sense of judgment also goes away. It's like, almost like a vicious cycle, right? You you are very careful, right? But if it hits you too quickly, then that care not is not there anymore. And you, you, you may start, you know, uh, doing things that uh, may be very difficult. So that I tell people also that, you know, if you thought that, just having a glass of wine was okay to go driving, you know, before bariatric surgery. Now it's a no-no. Do not drink and uh, drive after bariatric surgery again because the effect is a lot stronger, much more impactful, but also the effect can stay there for longer. So it's really very, very dangerous from that point of view. And then, of course, I talked about the fact of, uh, you know, the weight regain for patients who have had gastric bypass, they could have something called dumping syndrome, which is very, very unpleasant reaction, particularly if that alcoholic drink had too much sweet. But there are other things, come on. The alcohol itself can be corrosive. It can actually damage the lining of the stomach. It can lead to gastritis. It can lead to uh, ulcer formation. And ulcer formation, particularly after gastric bypass, is something that can happen. And it can be very, very serious problem because ulcers can burst ulcers can bleed, right? But then with excess alcohol, there is a much, much uh, lower threshold for getting things like liver damage as well, right? So really all these are important points. So people who had gastric bypass drinking excessive alcohol can end up with liver failure a lot more quickly than people who didn't have gastric bypass. So your ability to protect your liver is much less in that situation. And, and that would obviously be very very devastating. And there is another area that is very important, Kamal. How about becoming alcoholic after, you know, bariatric? How about falling into a trap of alcoholism? Well, as it happens, it can happen, right? It can happen. So anybody who felt they may be vulnerable to this, you know, before a bariatric surgery, their best point might be to just stay away completely, particularly if they were using food as a way of coping with stress. Now that they cannot do that because their stomach is too small, they can easily uh, you know, fall into a trap of utilizing alcohol, substituting alcohol to food. And that obviously would be devastating as well because alcoholism by itself is a devastating condition for anyone. Now, granted, in, in, it doesn't, this is not something that can happen only to somebody who was prone to alcoholism. Anybody can become alcoholic after bariatric surgery 
much more quickly, obviously, because as I said, that the amount of alcohol that are needed for somebody to become intoxicated uh, are, are much smaller. But this is an area which is very, very important for people to understand. So if there is any inclination for anybody to really become vulnerable to alcoholism, their best best option, best policy might be to abstain for, from alcohol completely. So uh, essentially the message I want us to give uh, Kamal is that there are real dangers when you start entertaining the utilization of alcohol after bariatric surgery. It doesn't mean you cannot, but your guardrail must be up and up really high so that you protect yourself, your health, and also don't fall into a situation where you start regaining weight because you're utilizing you know, empty calories uh, that come with alcohol. Today, we have a little bit more fun part of uh, one of the treatment options is the gas of balloon. Uh, so, Dr. Gabriel, can you give your help on that? Absolutely. So, essentially, uh, it is we're dealing with a chronic disease. Okay. It's a chronic disease in terms of its course, but also, like many other chronic diseases, it has different levels of severity. Right. Uh, if we look at a chronic disease like cancer, for instance, come on, there is stage one, there is stage two, there is stage three, stage four. Right. And that very often determines the type of treatment that the doctors will offer when they are faced with the, the different types. Right. So it doesn't mean that the treatments compete with each other or mutually uh, they are mutually exclusive. These treatments are offered in concomitants. Right. At different levels with different degree of uh, uh, involvement. So there may be a level one or a, a stage one cancer that may not require surgery, but there may be a level, a stage three or four cancer where surgery is absolutely necessary, right? So as you correctly said, we want to get to a level where we look at obesity in the same way, not telling the patients even, okay, which one would you like, but telling the patient, this is the best treatment you have, right? That level of understanding of obesity is, of course, not yet here, but we are getting there. We are getting there with education, right? So today we're going to talk about a type of treatment that is different from the used ones that we use uh, usually. So it is the placement of a gastric balloon inside the stomach to uh, treat obesity. Clearly, this is a very... Uh, non-invasive procedure when you compare it with the actual surgical procedures where the doctor actually makes incisions in the skin and enters the abdomen. With the gastric balloon, there is no such thing. We do not cut the skin. The balloon is placed inside the stomach by entering through the natural openings, right? The mouth, we go through the mouth when the patient is obviously taking a nap and is sedated and is under anesthesia. So we go through the mouth with an endoscope, we reach the stomach and we have instruments that allow us to deliver this balloon inside the stomach and inflate it make it like a balloon, becomes a fairly good sized balloon that is relatively heavy as well and we deposit it in the stomach. And the presence of the balloon mimics very much a stomach full of food, right? So that person will have the sensation as if they've had a really heavy Thanksgiving dinner or even two Thanksgiving dinners, right? So in that situation, the last thing that the person would want to have is more food. And really we are curtailing the food intake, appetite, and hunger with the presence of the balloon, right? So the balloon can be placed in the stomach very, very safely, and it can stay in the stomach for six months. So one of the great appealing aspects of the balloon, Kamal, is that it is non-invasive, of course, but it's also completely reversible because at the end of the six months, we are removing the balloon. Now, one could say that this favorable aspect, favorable aspect of the balloon, this advantage of the balloon of being reversible is also a weakness of the balloon, right? Because we're not dealing with a disease that is transient. We're dealing with a chronic disease. However, we're utilizing a transient procedure to treat it, right? But in the right set of people, this actually could work well. And when I say in the right set of people, I'm talking about people who have a certain range of 
obesity. And we talk about typically uh, class one and class two obesity. So these are people who have a body mass index anywhere between 30 kilograms per meter square and 40 kilograms per meter square. And it's important to compare that to the indications for invasive bariatric surgery, like the gastric sleeve or gastric bypass, where the indications for the procedure actually are triggered at a body mass index of 40 or greater. Now, you can see the analogy with cancer, right? A cancer that is advanced, like a body mass index of 50, would not be considered a simple obesity. Come on, that's a very severe obesity, right? So that needs to be treated much more aggressively with a procedure like um, gastric sleeve or gastric bypass, right? But when the obesity is not as significant as that, when it's between 30 and 40, we can utilize the balloon. As I said, the appeal of the balloon is that it is totally non-invasive. It is done with the person under sedation, okay? And then because it's non-invasive, because we're not doing any cutting, the potential for risks is also much less compared to the risks of other surgical procedures where we are actually dividing the digestive uh, organ. Now, people will think, well, that sounds great. So how about the results? Well, the results are good for the purposes that we are looking, right? So when we're treating somebody with a body mass index of 32, clearly we're not looking for that person to lose 100 pounds. Far from that. We're looking for a person to lose, what, 20 pounds, 25 pounds, right? And that is the range of, that, of weight loss that you see with the balloon as well, anywhere between 15, 20 pounds up to 45, and sometimes even 50 pounds. That's the range. So the expectation has to be set properly, right? It is important to understand that if I get a gentleman with a body mass index of 55 and their weight is 380 pounds and they are expecting to get a lot of weight loss with the balloon, that's not going to work. In fact, that's not a good indication for a balloon, right? But for somebody who has BMI of 32, 33, even 36, 37, and they really want to try something a little bit more than the medications, the balloon would be a good option. Now, what would, one would say, well, if it's only going to be there for six months and then you remove it after six months, it means hunger can come back after the six months. Yes, of course it can. But one of the good points that the balloon, Kamal, is that if a person has the balloon for six months, maybe that will create a mindset for a person to also change the way they are approaching food, fullness, appetite, and uh, 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 eating habits, essentially. And in fact, our program, as you know, Kamal, uh, requires for a person that is getting the balloon to have a nutrition uh, uh, encounter once a month, not only for the six months in which the balloon is in place, but for the full 12 months, which means six months even after the balloon. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the person to uh, develop good habits whilst the balloon is in place, while the tool is there, and then try to maintain those habits in the long term after the presence of the balloon as well. We are going to discuss uh, intermittent fasting. So we discussed it several times in the past. Um, well, uh, I think we reach out to more people with this topic because not just those who are going through the bariatric surgery uh, listening to this, but others are also listening because many people are doing this. Uh, we want to discuss the intermittent fasting uh, with uh uh, how it's being utilized in the bariatric surgery process. And also we can actually answer some of the generic, uh, generic questions that we may have from different people. Now, uh, how do we utilize uh, intermittent fasting in, in our process? So, I mean, um, let, let's, let's define it first. Right? As you said, we've talked about it in the past. So what is intermittent fasting? So as the wording you know, describes it, it is fasting in an intermittent fashion, right? So you are fasting certain periods of your day or, or your week, essentially, right? And that fasting essentially means total uh, abstinence from calorie intake, right? 
but that does not include water and uh, calorie-free drinks, essentially. So we do want to emphasize that we're not talking about dry fasting here. We're talking about water and fasting, where you are really, when you're fasting, you're actually drinking water. Not only is it allowed, but obviously it's very important that people know that drinking water is important. And we'll come to the uh, explanation of why this is important maybe uh, later on. So... Uh, how can you do intermittent fasting? Well, you can, for instance, decide that within a certain period of your waking hours during the day, you are going to eat no food at all, right? And that could be maybe, uh, you know, 16 hours out of the 24 hours, in which case you will have a window of eight hours in which you will be able to eat. And the 16 hours you don't, it could be 12, 12, it could be 18, 6. These are hours of the day in which you are fasting and then the window in which you are allowing yourself to eat. So this is one way of doing intermittent fasting. Another way of doing intermittent fasting that has been popularized uh, would be to really uh, look at days of the week. For instance, you could be eating normally five days out of uh, the week and then two days you would be fasting, like it would be like complete fasting where you really don't have uh, much to eat for about 48 hours out of those seven days, essentially. So that's another way of doing it. So, But the basic tenet here is that, come on, the basic tenet, and that's why I'm so much a fan of this uh, concept, is that you are taking a break from eating, right? Now, this is very important in my view, especially in societies like ours, right, where food availability is so prevalent that you cannot turn your eye one way without really facing an image of food in front of you, whether it's sitting on your table or it's on your screen, right? So food is very, very prevalent. And if we didn't have a sense of control, come on, we could be munching all mm -hmm. day long. And the only time we would be stopping eating would be when we are asleep. Well, in reality, this is not too far from what is happening. And in part, in part, the reason we're struggling with obesity is that prevalence, that availability of food, that associated with the biology that we have inherent, inherited from our ancestors, which is a biology that is driven to conserve energy and therefore to favor obesity, no wonder we have an epidemic in our hands. It didn't take, you know, more than a few decades for this to explode. And now look at the United States. Come on, there is hardly any state where the rate of obesity hasn't reached 30%. This is incredible. And, and yet along that, you also see an increased prevalence of type 2 diabetes, right? So in a society like this, one of the things we could do is ask ourselves, okay, I'm going to take a break. Take a break for one hour, take a break for two hours, take a break for six hours of the day where you just drink water so that you have a scheduled approach you're eating. And that's why in general, Kamal, I, I like intermittent fasting and I know you're a big fan of this as well, you know, uh, in several years that we've been doing this. So taking a break from eating, that's the biggest message that I think intermittent fasting does, right? Now, well, what it does, do, do you wanna say something? Go ahead. Well, uh, well um, it's, it's, I think it's a discipline, number one, and discipline, we use it in a positive way, not in a negative way. Discipline is something that, um, that we are capable of doing on a, uh, on a schedule. Now, of course, we are all, uh, we all have our own, uh, weaknesses and, uh, but one thing that's really important and what this, uh, intermittent fasting is doing for us is it's helping us to kind of better, um, keep a better record of what we do uh, because the time that we actually eat is limited.